Hey everybody, welcome back. Thanks for taking the time to watch Hello Good Game. We're continuing on with our Magic the Gathering Arena Guide for Beginners, going through A to Z, everything that you'll need to know to get you up to speed and on your feet in Magic the Gathering Arena. In the previous part of this series, we looked at how to build your dream aggro deck. Today, we're doing how to build your dream control deck. We're talking about the principles, strategies, guidelines, and customs in doing so. By the end of this video, you should be confident to build your own control deck using cards within your own collection to get around the net decking or potentially still net deck and then adjust the decks using these core strategies that we're about to teach you. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share to a friend and hit that bell icon to help support the channel. Let's get into it. First, let's begin a dialogue of what a control deck actually is. What are its strengths? What are its weaknesses? And how does it aim to win the game? A control deck is a term for a deck of cards that aims to control the opponent's cards and progression with ideally the end result being full control over everything that is done within the game. Control decks typically get their edge through card advantage and they are very powerful and present in nearly every format within the game. Control decks are, unlike aggro decks and combo decks, very defensive and reactive in nature. Because of this, control decks have some major downfalls in its pure state. These primary downfalls are, in order to reach the point of full control, one needs many resources and access to many different cards. Generally, if the opponent can play more spells and threats than we can respond to, pure control decks have difficulty recovering. Due to this, most decks uh, that focus on control have two major things in common. The first is continual card drawing. This is a major aspect in control decks as it keeps one's resources contingently uh, replenishing themselves. The vast majority of cards that are not win conditions or card drawing spells are spells that react to any threat one's opponent might play so that you can ideally respond to everything. Control decks intend to collect resources and defend themselves until they have total control of the game. At this point, they play a threat and continue to protect that threat until the threat kills the opponent. The manner in which these control decks defend themselves is most often how they're defined. Because control decks are defensive in nature, they often need to adopt elements of aggro decks or combo decks in certain metagames. Some control decks use combos to win rather than tr the traditional few threats, but not many. The average control deck uses so many control or removal spells that there is little to no room for an effective combo. When a control deck adopts some aggro elements, they usually use efficient creatures or spells to gain tempo early game. Most control decks that need to adopt certain elements of combo or aggro decks are forced to do so in a metagame where the decks are competing very quickly with turn 3 or turn 4 wins, making us use early game interruption rather than the mid game field wipes. Thus, the common long term plan of winning with control becomes too elaborate and ineffective early on as control deck powers up the longer the matches go. What makes control decks so good? Well, control decks avoid racing in attempts to slow the game down by executing an attrition plan. As the game progresses, control decks are able to take advantage of their more expensive, more powerful cards. The primary strength of control decks is the ability to devalue your opponent's cards. They can do this in four separate ways. The first is answering threats at a reduced cost. Given the opportunity, control decks can gain card advantage by answering multiple threats with just one spell. This is known as clearing or wiping the board. Stopping expensive threats with cheaper spells and drawing multiple cards or forcing the opponent to discard multiple cards with one single spell. Secondly, by not playing threats to be answered, by playing few proactive spells of our own, control decks gain virtual card advantage by reducing the usefulness of our opponent's removal spells. If we have no creatures, all of our opponent's creature removal now become dead cards. Thirdly is disrupting synergies. Even if control decks do not deal with every threat directly, they can leave out whichever stand out poorly on their own. A good example of this is an enchantment that buffs up your creatures. This is fine to leave hit the board as long as you don't let your opponent's creatures hit the board themselves. Fourth is dragging the game out past opposing preparations. An opponent's faster, more efficient cards will become less effective as the turns progress. Now that we have a better idea of exactly what a control deck is and can offer us as a player in Magic the Gathering Arena, let's take a look at some example archetypes within control. We have the classic blue X control. Now this is blue paired with any color that focuses around counter spells and is a permission based control deck. Next up, we have land destruction or land lock 
focusing on removing our opponent's resources and stopping them from playing them in general. We also have Mono Black, not your typical control. However, removal is densely populated within the black archetype and can be easily mixed with another color. If not, we just take note from earlier, add a little bit of an aggro element in it, and now our creatures can freely attack as we have a ton of removal to get rid of our opponent's threats. Finally, we have the Prison Archetype, which really relies on exiling our opponent's permanents, stopping them from drawing important cards, or untapping their permanents as well, right? So just shutting them down completely so they can't do anything. Now, this is one of my favorite types of control decks. Now that we've mentioned each archetype, we're going to break them down more in depth and give you guys a little bit of a visualization of what they each intend to do. First up, we're looking at Blue X Control. Now we mentioned how this was a counterspell based control deck or a permission based. So we really want to be holding up our mana, not really casting things on our opponent's turn. If he plays a threat that we need to counter, of course we do so. If we deem that it's not a threat, we can let it hit the field and then we can utilize some extra value on our opponent's end step, whether that be an instant speed draw, an instant speed scry, something like this, right? So it's really about playing on your opponent's turn, countering spells if you need to, and then if you don't, executing your value engines or your card draw advantage. Blue-white control, Azorius control, which we're showcasing today, has access to Dovin's Veto, Absorb, Shadow of the Sky, Elspeth Conquers Death, Teferi, Narset. So you can see the sheer value and power of these cards within the control archetype. Shutting down our opponent's play, their draw, their aggro, um, any recursion from the graveyard. So there's a lot of value within Azorius control. A quick reminder that it's not just Azorius control that is a permission-based control deck. There are others. For example, Mono Blue Control is also a permission-based control deck. Next up, we have Land Destruction or Land Locks. These decks focus on destroying your opponent's resources or limiting the amount that they can play. To exemplify this, we will be playing Saltai Land Destruction or Saltai Control. This is a really cool deck that mixes elements of midrange with control. We do have stuff like the Grazer, the Spiral, Uro, and Cultivate to help us ramp into some very oppressive spells. My favorite is Casualties of War. Now this is not only a classic land destruction card, but also some key forms of other removal as well. We can choose one or more, destroy target artifact, target creature, target enchantment, target land, or target planeswalker. So you can see potentially how much value we can get from a single card. And we talked about getting card advantage. This is an absolute perfectly way, uh, or a perfect way to do it, right? Potentially getting five cards off your opponent's board state just for one card out of your hand is extremely oppressive. So land destruction or land lock is one of the cooler control archetypes within Magic the Gathering. Salt Eye is not the only color combination for land destruction or land lock. Some of the colors that incorporate these archetypes within them are black, red, and green, potentially blue for the effect of land lock making your opponent's permanents not untapped during their untapped step. So don't be worried, Salta is not the only flavor. I just really wanted to flex on Casualties of War as it is one of the best multicolored removal spells. Mono Black Control is rampant with removal. It seems like almost every black spell is removal, either destroy or exile, right? Really, really valuable color for control decks just because of the removal. It's not only removal that black has access to though, it's also discard effects. Now this is a great way for control deck to gain card advantage using one card to potentially have your opponent discard multiples is even better than dealing with the threats once they're cast or once they're on the field. Now again, black doesn't have access to any counter spells. So when spells are cast, they're gonna hit the field and it's up to us to remove them However, black has a ton of instant speed removal, and much like the other decks, uh, permission-based counter deck, we want to withhold our mana. If our opponent plays a threat, we remove it with available mana. If not, now we execute our draw engine to make sure that we're continuing to replenish our removals. So mono black control is not your typical solo control color. However, it is an option when combined with either aggro or combo 
just so you can get some of those early game threats out on the field and then protect them, remove any of your opponent's blockers and kill him in a more tempo styled race than control is typically used to. However, if you're looking to add mono black or black in general to a different archetype, especially within control, this is a great addition. We mentioned the removal, we mentioned the exile, we mentioned the discard effects. So black has a lot to offer within the control archetypes. The prison control archetype within Magic the Gathering is incredibly fun. You get to stop all of the fun things that your opponent wants to do. We get to sacrifice their creatures so Hexproof doesn't save them or protection. We can have them discard cards directly from their hand so we gain card advantage. We have access to field wipes so even further field advantage and protection from aggro decks. We also have instant speed draw engines to keep our resources coming back. Orzhov Prison really shines when we stop letting our opponents do what they want to do though. If we can shut down drawing multiple cards per turn, we can shut down them playing at instant speed. Maybe we can even keep their lands from untapping potentially, right? Or their creatures. Just keep everything locked down, stop their draw, stop them playing when they want to play. And then even you can potentially stop them from playing multiple spells each turn, searching their library, having you sacrifice things. There are so many different aspects and routes that you can take while building a prison control archetype. Today, we're showcasing Orzhov Prison, which again has a lot of access to removal via destroy and exile. Exile is a little bit better. It also has draw engines. It has field wipes. It has powerful planeswalkers to juice extra value out of it as well. And of course, it has things like deafening silence to keep your opponent from playing multiple cards each turn. Uh, rule of law as well comes to mind. That's a great prison card for a control deck. So if you're looking to have fun while proactively stopping your opponent from having fun, the prison archetype within control might be right for you. Some of my favorite colors to fit within this archetype are white, black, and blue. Blue allows the addition to have our opponent's permanence not untap, which is almost like gaining another turn, which is a lot of fun. Speaking of gaining another turn, blue also has that ability available to it. What better way to stop your opponents from doing things than to not even let them have a turn? All right, we've gone through all of the different control archetypes. Hopefully now you have a better idea of what each individual one entails and going forward, picking your favorite from among them. Let's open up our game client and begin talking about some of the principles I incorporate with all of my deck builds, 500 plus of them, so you guys can build some killer control decks for yourself based on your own collection. So we have our game client open. We're ready to build a fresh deck. We want to build a control deck. We learned about all of the different control archetypes. Now we're going to pick one. Uh, I kind of want to combine a few. I'm looking to, in today's video, demonstrate how to build a permission based deck along with a removal based deck. So we're going to go and we're going to try to play today within Esper colors potentially. I've been having a lot of fun with Esper recently. So it should be a generally uh, pretty straightforward process as I'm so familiar with my collection. So again, one of my biggest recommendations to a new deck builder is to familiarize yourself with your collection. You can't build a good deck until you know about all of your cards and what they all do. It's a big task and as Arena continues to evolve, more cards are gonna be added to the pool and the task is gonna become even more daunting than it already is. With that being said, once you have all of your cards memorized, I wanna identify some strong core cards to use within the deck. We said that we wanna play control. We're thinking about not allowing our opponents to do things while doing things ourselves. We've mentioned Narset a few times. This is an incredible card. Um, each opponent can't draw more than one card each turn. Please and thank you. And again, I recommend that we over add and then subtract. While I've got Narset in the field here, I'm directed to Cry of the Carnarium. All creatures get minus two, minus two until end of turn. Exile all creature cards in all graveyards that were put there from the battlefield this turn. If a creature would die this turn, exile it instead. This is a great card, uh, just a little bit of spice for utility to deal with some of the recursion decks. We have Cauldron Familiar that comes back and back and back, but this way we'll be able to get it off the field for good. Send it to exile with Cry of the Carnarium. Also dealing with some of the low to the ground aggro matches. That's just a little bit of a sweeper for us to help us move on to the later game. 
we have Narset, and now we want Teferi. I'm sure you guys know of Teferi. Who doesn't at this point? We are pretty lucky in the fact that he hits rotation very soon. Each opponent can cast spells only any time they could cast a sorcery. So we're shutting down our opponent's ability to use instant speeds off of their sorcery phase. So if you play something on the stack, even though it's their main phase, they can't play an instant on the stack because that's at instant speed, not at sorcery speed. So Teferi does a great job uh, within the prison art of, or aspect to shut down our opponent, the same as Narset, right? Prive the Carnarium is within the removal aspect of control. Let's move on a little bit. Another core card that I really like to put my control decks around is Elspeth Conquers Death. This is an enchantment saga, so it triggers three times when you play it, and then on each of your following upkeeps. On the first turn when you play it, exile target permanent and opponent controls with converted mana cost three or greater. So this is great if you can get a five drop or more, because then it's even value, right? However, there's a couple other things that this card does, so the value goes a little bit beyond just exiling their creature. On the next turn, non-creature spells your opponent cast cost two more to cast until your next turn. That's great. That's making things a little bit harder for them to do following our prison archetype. And then return target creature card or planeswalker card from the battlefield, uh, from the graveyard to the battlefield, sorry, and put a plus one, plus one counter or a loyalty counter on it, depending on whether it was a creature or planeswalker. So you get a little bit additional value here with Elspeth Conqueror's Death on the back end, which I find very friendly, especially when we're going to be focusing a lot around planeswalkers because we don't want to have too many creatures on the field because we want to be using uh, removal like Shadow of the Sky. So we really want to make sure um, that the symmetrical effect is benefiting us uh, rather than hindering us, right? So no creatures within today's control deck. Elspeth Conquers Death. We are talking about removal, so we need more of that, obviously. Shatter the Sky. Destroy all creatures, uh, and then each player who controls a creature with power 4 or greater draws a card. This brings us back to the symmetrical effect. We are beneficial here because we don't have creatures. Our opponent can benefit if he has a creature power 4 or greater. He's going to get to draw the card. However, if he has multiple creatures on the field and we remove it with one, we're coming out even as we're doing a one-for-one one scenario uh, because of the draw. And if he doesn't have any big creatures and multiple creatures, then we're leaps and bounds ahead, getting that multiple value for one card to eat up three or four of our opponents. We have to shatter the sky. We need a little bit of a draw engine to make the deck a little bit more consistent. Um, draw engines at instant speed are very nice. Omen of the Sea has flash, meaning we can cast it on our opponent's turn. And then another uh, principle that I really like to uh, get around, and we're going to take Omen of the Sea out for uh, a little bit. So we have our core cards, right? 42 out of 60. Narset shuts down our opponent. Teferi shuts down our opponent. We have early field wipes with Cry. We have later on field wipes with Shatter the Sky. And single target removal with Elspeth Conquers Death. Um, maybe just a little bit more removal before we move on. I like Extinction Event. Um, it's similar to Shattered the Sky. You don't hit all the creatures, but he's not going to get the draw out of it, which is a lot of fun for me. So after we've dealt and put in our core cards that we want to build around for our specific archetype for control, we can go ahead and start talking about the mana. We want to be hitting our land drops consistently because we don't want to lock on three and not be able to shatter. That will be the difference between surviving, gaining control, and losing the match. So we're talking about our mana, hitting our land drops, and taking card advantage. This is done a few different ways. A great way to do it is uh, the Birth of Maltese, right? This gains us life, so it's a little bit of survivability. We get to create the 0-4 Defender, so that is more sustainability as a blocker, right? And then we're making sure that we consistently hit our land drops. It's a 2-drop that's going to allow us to search another planes from our library, which is really just going to make the consistency of us getting to our two planes for our Shattered the Sky that much more relevant. We also like uh, to have a little bit more of a draw engine. To draw planes is great. It gets it out of your library. But what if we need to draw some removal? Well, this is where Omen of the Sea comes in. This is a great card. It's got Flash. We're casting it on our opponent's turn. When it enters the battlefield, we get to Scry 2 and then draw a card. So equivalently, we're looking at the top three cards of our library for something that we want, um, whether it be single target removal, Elspeth, field removal, Shatter, 
or just an oppressive feature like Teferi or Narset to shut our opponent down. So we're sitting at 52 cards here. Um, our land is definitely lacking. I'm not sure what's up with that. Um, 13, 14 lands, is that? Why would it only give us... It says 24, but I only see um, 14. So that's incredible. I'm not too sure what's up with that, but let's let's not focus on that too much. We're, we're going to balance the land a little bit later. Uh, let's continue to look for draw effects. We have Opt, which is a very nice draw. Radical Idea, potentially, as well. Since we are within Esper colors, I think uh, gaining life and removal might be uh, semi-nice. So we should take both of Kaya. This is going to uh, deal damage to our opponent, and then whenever he attacks a Planeswalker, we control. We're going to gain a little bit of life there. And then also, there is another Teferi. And Teferi is just always good in a control matchup. Um, so let's take a couple more Teferis, and then maybe another Kaya, just because she's able to use an exile through her minus one, uh, which I think is quite nice. So we're sitting a, a little bit prettier here, and then we need a win condition. What is the win condition of this deck? Um, we used to use Dream Trawler, but I've been uh, going towards the Shark Typhoon recently. Um, it can be cycled, which is really nice, and it can also be used as the enchantment that whenever we cast another non-creature spell, we're going to create an XX Shark where that X is that creature's or that spell's converted mana cost, which is really nice. So you'll see, we kind of have our deck coming together now. We're not really playing a permission-based aggro deck. There's no counter spells here. This is more of a removal slash prison style deck where we're stopping uh, all of the things our opponent's doing and just trying to survive that way until we can get our win condition, right? So let's try to balance this deck a little bit. We're sitting a little bit heavy. We don't have too much to trim. I'm thinking... Uh, a birth or an omen probably a birth omens really nice the whole game birth is just good off of the start so we have our deck we need to balance our land now the control decks run up to 26 land you're going to notice that that is a consistent uh modality within control decks is the amount of land that they run is quite a bit higher than an aggro deck or a mid-range deck this comes down to consistency of lands draw we talked about how an aggro deck can beat you early game, but if you can stretch that match out, your chances of winning increase drastically. So it's really important for us defensively to never miss a land draw. This means curving out to four consistently, perfectly, every single turn or every single match, right? So this is why the increased amount of land within the deck. And then we also have the draw effects to help us find the land to make it a little bit friendlier. Having a lot of land in the deck isn't enough though. We have to balance this land and it's a little bit of a pain within Esper uh, or any three color deck. And again, I do recommend if you guys have wild cards to burn, you spend them on rare lands. We're talking Fable Passages, Triomes, Shock Lands, Tapped Lands or Check Lands are also known as, right? So get those rare lands. They're really going to help you be more consistent. For example, uh, anything with white in it is going to make Shadow of the Sky um, just be that more prevalent and consistent. So we are looking for land here. We have Hall of Fountain, has white and blue in it. That's nice. Temple of Enlightenment also gives us a scry. That's quite nice. Let's take some Temple of Silences for the same scry effect. Uh, also quite nice. What else are we missing? Just a little bit of Demir, right? So let's take a couple of these as well. So now we have a more friendly uh, land base than before. We could even take a Fable Passage or two, or better yet than a Fable Passage, a Castle Vantress. So there's a couple really cool lands uh, available to us within control decks. Castle Lockthwain is a draw engine. That's a must keep. Castle Vantress is also a must keep as it's a scry engine. And then Castle Ardenvale doesn't really hurt either, just to create uh, the 1-1 one, one human tokens. Not necessarily as important as Castle Vantress. Castle Vantress, uh, to me, is more important. But uh, Castle Ardenvale is also a lot of fun, regardless. Um, the Passage will help us pick the cards that we need out. Right, if we ever need to pull uh, one of our basic lands out. 
the fatal passage will do that for us. And then we have a regular plains, we have a regular island, and a regular swamp as well. So maybe passage doesn't really fit the deck as well. Let's manage our land. Eight islands, eight plains, and seven swamps for 24 total. Okay, I think that's really nice. So you've seen through a very simple build process how I was able to erect an Esper control deck. Now this is a prison based slash removal deck where we are locking our opponent down through Narset, through Teferi, um, exiling his cards through Elspeth, through Extinction Event, through Kaya, right? And then using our finisher of Shark Typhoon to close out our opponent once we've gained that, uh, that value and won the Attrition War. Getting rid of all of his cards from the field and his hand, he's now top decking and we can just lay in with some big sharks. So this was my general uh, guide for Esper. When we pull up our deck details, we get an overview of everything that's included within our deck. We can see that we have eight sorceries, 16 enchantments, 12 planeswalkers, and 24 lands, not a single creature and 36 non-creatures. So we're really making use of our field wipes, making sure we're not losing any value throughout that process and absolutely obliterating our opponents while holding up all of the oppression effects from Teferi, from Narset, and then the removal as well through Elspeth Conqueror's Death, and then our finisher. So we get to see our mana curve, and I really recommend that you guys start becoming aware of the mana curve and how it's going to affect your game plan. We showed you guys yesterday the relative power level per turn for all the different deck archetypes in the first part of the series. Now Esper started at 0% power level, and as it went to turn 10, it went to 100% power level. So you'll notice that the mana curve for this deck is shifted far to the right. We have no zero drops. We have no one drops. We get some two drops. And then we start to lay in with a good majority of three drops, a few four drops, and then we begin to taper back down again. So you'll see how this is not an aggro deck. It's got no early drops. This is a mid-range to late-range deck, right? So you'll see the example mana curve I have on screen for you guys. And it's representing exactly what I just said, where we have few to little early game drops, a lot of mid game drops, and then a few huge uh, threats later on in the game to help us win. So try to remember this mana curve while you're building your decks to ensure that you are following the archetype game plan. That's it, you guys. This was my guide for how to build your very first control deck. Now again, base these cards that you're building with upon your collection, but be sure to follow the principles, strategies, guidelines, and customs that we covered today because removal is removal. Just some removal obviously is better than others, but that's how the cookie crumbles as a free-to-play or beginner. You start with what you have, you begin to farm, learn the game, get those wild cards, and work your way into some of these top tier decks. A quick recap before we get you guys on your way building some wicked control decks. So what is a control deck again? It aims to control the opponent's plays, removing what he does play, countering what he wants to play, and then stopping him from doing certain aspects of the game, whether that be untapping his lands or permanents, um, playing multiple spells each turn, searching his library, etc, etc. So control decks are the opposite of an aggro deck. An aggro deck is strong very early, the control deck is strong very late game, and the midrange takes up that middle part of the game. Uh, in order to reach the point of total control, Many control decks have to play catch up. This is done through field wipes, uh, neutralizing the board state and allowing them to stabilize and then gain that control aspect that they're so looking forward to. Uh, a big part of control decks is instant speed drawing. This is done uh, by playing on your opponent's turn, holding up your mana to counter a threat that he plays or remove a threat that he plays. If they don't play a threat for you to remove, now we can access our draw engine free and clear without wasting any mana. Uh, the vast majority of cards that are not win conditions or card drawing spells react to any one of our opponent's threats so that we can easily respond to anything that he plays. Control decks are like a toolbox of decks. They normally have answers for everything. It's just a matter of if you can get through your library, through drawing, through scrying uh, effects like this to find the correct answer for your opponent's deck. Control decks also intend to collect resources and defend themselves until they can gain total control. 
This is done through not falling too far behind in tempo and dealing with our opponent's threats proactively. If we can get card advantage for two for ones, three for ones, four for ones, using one card to deal with multiple cards of our opponents, this is a great way to catch up on some of that tempo that we lost out early on in the game. While doing this, we neutralize and have a fresh starting point, hopefully taking our opponent's card advantage away from him while still having our own. We talked about the different kinds of control decks and how you can mix and match pieces of them to form your own, whether that be a black control with a creature-based deck or just adding that black removal to one of your control decks that you've already made, like the Azorus control that we did earlier, turning it into a full-fledged Esper control deck. So a few more reminders. Control decks avoid racing and try to regain the tempo that they lost early game later on with a field wipe or a board wipe. Try not to play any threats for your opponent to answer. This is going to give you virtual card advantage. Again, if they have field wipes and you have no creatures, that's a dead card in their hand. The same goes with the cards they play. If the card they're playing doesn't directly affect you negatively, let it hit the board. Leave it alone. No harm, no foul. Why use your counterspell or removal on a card that is not going to win your opponent in the game? So distinguish what threats are really going to affect you negatively and then single those ones out as a priority. Another great way to win the game is disrupt their synergies. Maybe they have auras and creatures. The auras are no good without creatures. So we can easily break down our opponent's deck, disrupt their synergy, and now similar to not playing threats, we're removing a lot of their cards uh, from being viable. Just like when we don't play creatures, their removal is no longer viable. If we remove their creatures, their enchantments or auras are no longer viable there as well. We can also drag the game on, which is a great uh, strategy for control decks, getting rid of our opponent's values and resources while continuing to have a plenty and healthy amount ourselves, right? So these are a couple key components within control decks for you guys to remember. They're gonna help you in the future while you build your own control decks. This was, I think, episode three of MTG Arena Guide for Beginners. We looked at all of the different archetypes, then we looked at aggro, today we looked at control, tomorrow is mid-range, so I hope you guys are ready for some big, bad creatures. We are gonna ramp to the moon and beyond. So don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share to a friend, hit that bell icon so you're notified of all of our future uploads. I really appreciate your time and attention. Those of you supporting the channel financially, you're actually making things like this possible and a reality. So not only myself, but the whole community thanks you. This is absolutely amazing content to be producing. I'm live on YouTube every single day, 6 a.m. Mountain Standard. At 7 a.m. we go live on Twitch for three to four hours, and then we're in the Discord for the remainder of the day. Links for everything in the description below, you guys. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Take care, and I'm looking forward to talking about mid-range tomorrow with you all. Peace. Right.